Good morning, biology friends. Today we're going to start talking about um, the topic of ecology, the unit of ecology. We're going to talk about the interactions between living organisms. All right, giddy up, let's go. A couple of terms to throw at you. Number one, the biosphere. Pretty much everything that can contain life, right? So the land, the ocean, and the air which also contains living things. Um, another term to know is the ecosystem, living and non-living things. Population, it's a group of organisms of the same species. So a population of elk, a population of wild dogs, a population of ants. They're all the same species and they're living in the same area together. Um, a community is a group of different populations that all live in the same ecosystem. So, for example, you've got a um, population of water snakes, a population of crickets, a population of frogs, a population of uh, water striders, all living in the same ecosystem near a body of water. So they're a community together, they're interacting together, and habitat is where all those organisms live. Shows you a picture of an ecosystem here. So it's got all the different organisms. So you've got the mushrooms, you've got the lichens, you've got the animals. They're all living together. Population. Right here, you get all of the lions, all of the peacocks. Same species. Community. All the organisms living together in the same area. So these all organisms all live together. These all organisms all live together and they are based on a food web or a food chain. Then we've got all kinds of habitats all over the world. Just innumerable. All right, so the interactions become interesting when there's something called comp competition. So you can compete for food, resources, mates, um, living environments. You can compete for all different kinds of things. And that's when the interactions get a little bit gruff because you have to be able to control population size. We can't have a world that's overrun by deer. That's a big problem. We can't have a world that's overrun by cockroaches. All right. We're going to talk about things called carrying capacity and limiting factors. Limiting factors are those things like diseases or the amount of resources that a, uh, a group of organisms that can have. Um, carrying capacity is how many organisms of the same species can exist in one area at the same time. So let's say, for example, you have a, um, a population of deer, and eventually there are going to be so many deer living in the same area that they start to die off because they're not able to compete well for resources. They're starting to get hit by cars. They're starting to get decimated by disease, things like that. So there will only be so many deer that could possibly live in one area at the same time. And once that number has is reached, nature is going to just take care of it. The population is not going to keep going up and up and up and up forever. It's physically impossible. We've never seen it, right? Bacteria, viruses, they can reproduce uh, large, large, large numbers before we start being affected. But isn't that interesting? That's kind of what we're seeing now, right? We are seeing a very large increase in certain viruses, and eventually that amount is going to flatten out, and they're going to stop replicating. We're going to shut them down. Let's talk about how populations change, obviously, when things are born or hatched or they sprout, that's coming into being, and then death rates. So we measure birth rates, death rates in populations. We look at populations that move. We're going to look at monarch butterflies, and they move from one place to another. So we track those populations. And then we also look at the problem of exponential growth. Human beings are on an exponential growth curve right now. And isn't it interesting that Mother Nature is starting to level off our population, maybe? Have we reached the human carrying capacity? It's an interesting thing to think about. All right, so I've got a couple of different cool examples for you throughout this. The first example is you have competition naturally for um, space 
for resources for mates. So you've got, in this example, two majorly fierce organisms. You've got a bull shark, that's right, a shark, fighting a hippopotamus. Let's find out what happens. This is a White House in chaos. There's so much chaos. Chaos at the White House. At this moment, when there's so much fear in the country, we need presidential leadership that's honest, trusted, truthful, and steady. There you go. You got an ad in there. Sorry, guys. Bad tempered brawler versus streamlined predator. A 7,000 pound hippo will fight anything it moves. But is it a match for a 700 pound bull shark? Let's look at what each brings to the fight. A big male hippo can be more than 11 feet long and five feet tall at the shoulder. He tips the scales at 7,000 pounds. Main weapons, tusk-like teeth. Each lower canine is more than a foot long and can weigh almost two and a half pounds. Those canines may look blunt, but the inner edges sharpen themselves as they grind together. Because its dental armory is so heavy, the hippo has an oversized lower jaw powered by huge muscles. The jaw hinges far back, giving the hippo a flip top head. Up to 11 feet long and weighing 700 pounds, the bull shark is the pit bull terrier of the shark world, armed with lethal cutting teeth. They're blamed for more attacks on humans than any other species of shark. The bull shark is just as happy in a freshwater lake or river as it is in the sea. Bull sharks are ambush predators. They wait patiently for the right moment, then make their move. They use two techniques. If they're not sure of their target, they bump, then bite. If they are sure, it's a deadly hit at 11 miles per hour. Jowls meets jaws when hippo and bull shark go head to head. The bull shark begins the encounter with an exploratory bump. After confirming the hippo's food, it tries to get in some bites. The hippo's thick hide, combined with his enormous girth, is too much of a mouthful for the smaller shark. Even the thin skin behind the back leg proves too tough for the shark. The hippo doesn't know what hit him, but that bad temper lights a fire in his belly. Once the hippo begins his counterattack, the tide turns. The hippo's enormous jaws easily encircle the shark. It's impaled on those foot-long tusks and crushed. The big guy won. There you go. Yes. Who won? That's right. The hippo won. Crazy. All right. Let's continue on here with our exploration. Get back to our notes. You're taking notes, aren't you? Yes, I hope you are. Okay. So another kind of interaction that we can see in nature is competition for resources of the nesting site variety. So this Gila woodpecker right here, he lives in this cactus called a saguaro cactus. And there are other critters because there are so few places to nest in the desert. This little guy right here, this pygmy owl, he also wants to live in this cactus. So the Gila woodpecker, we're going to watch him trying to keep other birds and lizards even from getting into his nest. So there's our woodpecker friend.
they will stand guard over this nest like soldiers and they will keep other birds from entering a nest once they have claimed it. Isn't that wild? Those little woodpeckers. All right, so are there limits to how big the populations can get? Obviously, yes, there are living limits. You've got uh, other organisms, you've got bacteria, diseases, things like that. And you've got non-living uh, factors that are also going to limit population size. So environmental factors such as the amount of water, the amount of sunlight, the amount of food, things like that. Those are also the amount of um, rainfall, not just water to drink, but rainfall. So organisms like plants can live. So these are all things that can limit I said before that the deer population is a great example of carrying capacity. And that would be, if you take a look at this huge amount of deer right here, what we tend to see at certain times of the year are deer on the side of the road. And it's not because they're stupid or, you know, have a death wish or anything like that. It's simply because there are too many of them. So when the deer population gets high, they tend to go out into areas where they normally wouldn't go, like expressways in our backyards and things like that. And that's one of the ways that we know that the deer population is reaching its carrying capacity, which is how many organisms the ecosystem can um, successfully feed and take care of and support. When it reaches that, then we start to see the deer diving into our cars and crossing the road and things like that. So that's the concept of carrying capacity. So a change in population would be, an um, example of that would be migration. So there are herds of animals, large animals like these deer right here, that move from one place to another. They breed in one place and then they live in another place. Monarch butterflies every year make a huge journey from one end of the continent to another. And we're going to take a look at that right now. Some examples of migration. Changes in population. Every, Every year, millions, millions of monarch, monarch butterflies, butterflies go to the high, high mountains of Mexico, Mexico for hibernation. They, they make, make a 4,000 kilometer journey, journey back north three, three months, months later. later. We, we leave, leave you this week with a look at their amazing trip. trip. We, we look, look forward to seeing you here again next week for another edition of America's Now. Thanks for watching. So what are we saying there? When scientists are asking for their path to be preserved, why are these monarch butterflies dying? This is my cat, in the alley. <laughs> Very old and just fell off the table. <laughs> so
So what are scientists talking about when they say we need to preserve their path? Too many of them are dying. So what's happening in this migratory path is that um, we're cutting down fields of flowers. We're cutting down trees. We're cutting down areas where the monarchs would normally um, stop and get some nectar on this long, long journey. And we've now removed that food source from them. So that is a limiting factor. It's a non-living limiting factor, the amount of food that these organisms have to survive. Another change in population that we're interested in, specifically because it's humans and aren't we always interested in the human population, um, we're, it's suggested that we're now about 7.4 billion people on the planet. If we keep growing and reproducing the way we have been in recent years, by 2050, there could be 9 billion people on the planet. That's a lot. So, what does 9 billion even look like? Let's take a look at a map that shows what 9 billion looks like. We're going to start here with just a few people on the planet. So we're not, we're in the early, early, early time. And where are most of the people on the planet? hundreds. Still not a whole lot here in North America, right? Big time explosion in Europe, in Asia, in India, more in Africa. Ah, now 1900s. So now in 2000s. Check out that difference between where they were and where they ended up, right? That's pretty crazy to think about. So could we become overpopulated as a species? Could human beings overpopulate the earth? Well, it's possible. How would it be possible? Because we're living longer, we're healthier, we're having more offspring, and we're able to travel around the world so much. So it's a great thing that we're healthy, but it also means that more and more of us are going to survive, and we're going to start competing. We've seen this already. We're competing for resources. Not only are we competing for resources with each other, and we're hopefully pretty civil about that, we're competing for resources with other living things, other animals, other plants, space. We're competing for all of those things. So when we talk about plants and animals and interactions and all that kind of thing, we've got two basic, um, very, very basic, organisms or types of organisms within a community. You have the plants and the algae, the bacteria, those things, some of the bacteria that can photosynthesize. So they're called producers. So anything that takes the sun's energy and converts it to chemical energy that other organisms use is called a producer. And it is always at the bottom of the food chain, so to speak, because it's taking energy from the sun it doesn't have to consume other organisms. It doesn't eat other organisms. Anything that then has to consume either a plant or an animal that eats a plant is a consumer. So we're called consumers because we have to either eat a plant or eat an animal in order to stay alive. Pretty basic. That's eighth grade stuff, right? So within the consumer group, we have the plant eaters, we have the meat eaters, and we have most of us are omnivores. We eat both meat and plants. One group that we often forget is the decomposer group, right? And imagine this. Imagine a world where nothing, like this possum right here, nothing decomposed it. Nothing got rid of the dead stuff. We'll look at that in a second here. What would happen if all of the decomposers were taken away? Let's say that um, you had a squirrel who died in the woods of natural causes. He fell out of the tree whatever. So what would happen if that squirrel died and then two or three mice died and then this elk died and the moose died and the bodies of all these organisms just stayed there or they got eaten by something else but then never um, got put back into the food chain. Decomposers are integral and decomposers are things like fungi can be decomposers, bacteria can be decomposers, 
You can even have um, earthworms that are going to help decompose or break down organic material and put it back into the food chain. So not only would we have a bunch of dead animals, dead plants laying around without decomposers, we wouldn't have the nutrients, um, the organic material that would get cycled back into the ecosystems. And we'll talk more about that in another unit. But that would be pretty disgusting if nothing decomposed. Ugh. All right, last but not least, we're gonna talk about some different kinds of relationships that happen in nature. We've got the mutualistic relationship where both organisms benefit. It can be two plants, it can be two animals, it can be a plant and an animal. Uh, lichens are the famous example, and that is two organisms living together. You've got bacteria and fungi. And lichens are those cool, like almost like mossy green things that live on the sides of trees. You often see them on the bark of trees. It's two organisms living together. The bacteria and the fungi are working together to one is doing the photosynthesis which is bacterial the algae bacterial algae are working with the fungi and the fungi is providing the nutrients for the other organism to live commensalism is another example of a relationship in nature and that is when one organism benefits but the other one is doesn't benefit and it's not harmed either so a famous commensalistic relationship is that of the clownfish and the sea anemone the clownfish gets the protection of the stinging cells of the sea anemone, and the sea anemone doesn't really get a whole lot of anything. Now, in Nemo, they claim that the clownfish will brush the anemone, and in some cases, you know, that's true, but the anemone doesn't need that, right? So it's not harmed, it doesn't really benefit, and so that's a commensalistic relationship, commensalism. Parasitism, parasite, we all know what those are, right? Fleas on a dog. Um, some kinds of harmful bacteria in us, they're parasites, so they live off another organism and they harm it. So here are some examples for you for each of those different kinds of relationships. In just a second. Before we get to that, let's talk about, um, people pronounce this two ways, either niche or niche. It's technically pronounced niche, but that is the organism's role in the environment. So um, some fungi, their role is to be a decomposer in the environment. Some organisms' role is to be a producer. It's going to make energy for the environment. So in this example right here, you've got a predator-prey relationship, and that is that organism's role. It is the role of that organism is sometimes to be prey for another organism. It's basically its job is to be food, right? So let's talk about this first relationship here. We've got a cheetah. Yep, you know it. Attacking that poor old gazelle. I don't take responsibility at all. Oh, Lord, here we the go again. The coronavirus. This is the new hoax. We have it totally under control. Okay. We really think we've done a great job in keeping it down to a minimum. Mm, sorry, I don't take guys. responsibility at all. Mm, sorry. There we go. And it's dead. So you've got three organisms here. This guy, the hyena, his role is to eat the dead stuff that's left over. He's not really a decomposer, but he does get rid of dead things because hyenas don't typically kill their own uh, food. The cheetahs, in this case, have killed this poor gazelle, and the hyena is chasing them away. Hyenas are pretty mean. So a hyena's role is basically to steal the food of other organisms, provide a little competition there, which is kind of crazy, right? In the second relationship here, you have cheetahs that are working together to bring down the food.
Female cheetahs hunt alone, but males hunt in packs. Males like these are usually brothers, and they usually bond for life. Working as a pack, they can tackle bigger prey, like these wildebeests. And when the brothers are hungry, not even a little bad weather will slow them down. The Ferrari of animals, able to accelerate from zero to 60 in three seconds. But its temperature soars so high If it doesn't stop after 300 yards, it could die. But that's why it's in a pack. Two more with fresh legs. Once they bring the wildebeest down, the cheetahs choke it to death. A truly lethal band of brothers. All right. So you've got organisms there whose sole purpose is to hunt and kill or to be killed. They are the prey. That is their niche, their role in the environment. Now you have an interesting relationship right here, this niche organism. This is called an oxpecker bird, and this is a musk, musk ox. And what this oxpecker does is it eats the bugs, the insects that live on the back of this musk ox, musk ox. and it gets a free ride. It sits on the back of this guy, rides around, and it gets a free meal. So the role of the oxpecker in this particular environment is to eat the insects off of the back of this organism. Isn't that crazy? I don't know if I want that to be my role, but it is the role of this particular bird. All right, here's our picture of our mutualism going on here. This is a lichen. Depending on what color the organisms are, gives you the color of the lichen. We use lichens to predict things uh, like the amount of pollution that's going on in an area. We can study the lichens and see how different things affect pollution-wise. This is our commensalism relationship, clownfish, sea anemone, and our parasitic relationship. I think I've told you this before, but the longest paras parasitic tapeworm that was removed from a human was from a tiny little Asian lady, and the tapeworm was 32 feet long. Disgusting. Parasite doesn't help because all it does is it uses the um, nutrients that are coming through the intestines, that's where it lives, and it lives off of the intestines of the organism, whether it's a person or an animal, it lives off them and it makes them sick. So par parasites are not good. All right, friends, that's it for today. We're almost got a 30 minute mark. Have an awesome day. Take notes, quick quiz, manana.